Wow, 50 years doesn't seem possible, does it? But I remember that day pretty well with uh, John, uh, or John Young and uh, Joe Garagiola was here as well. Gus has been honored with his name on uh, many things, ranging from uh, roads and bridges to uh, schools and libraries. But I think he's probably the proudest of the memorial here at Spring Mill. It's a place where he spent uh, lots of time growing up, but most of all, it's home for uh, Molly Brown. I think Molly Brown was uh, the spacecraft that was probably uh, Gus's greatest achievement. And uh, Gus was the oldest in the family, followed by my uh, sister Wilma, my brother Norman. I was the youngest in the family, but a recent event, I was asked if I was Gus's father. <laughs> and there's one thing about being 87, you're not referred to as the baby any longer. <laughs> Gus was selected for Project Mercury out of a pool of 544 military test pilots. He also went to Mitchell High School. We all went to Mitchell High School, and if you've been through the muse museum here, you probably noticed those report cards. I guess at best we could say Gus was an average student. And once somebody asked me what I thought Gus would have to say about the memorial, and I said, well, he'd probably say, get those report cards out of there. <laughs> But I really think that maybe those report cards are one of the most important things that we have here. I would hope that they show young kids that you don't necessarily have to be number one in your class or a star athlete to achieve great things. If you know anything about Gus, you know that uh, he loves speed and he loved Corvettes. And every time I used to go down to the Cape, someone used, usually had a story for me about Gus and his Corvette. Jay Barbary, the uh, NBC space correspondent, he relates this story in his book, Live from Cape Canaveral. Gus worked late at the Space Museum one night and started back to the motel in the wee hours when he was backing up Shepard before the first flight. He had his vent on deserted US-1 where his speed of 100 plus was sweet. He, when he picked up a Florida Highway Patrol, he put the pedal to the metal, made a high-speed turn onto the 520 causeway, and raced for Cocoa Beach. A sheriff's deputy joined the Highway Patrol in the chase. The two were doing their best to wake up the Space Coast with their sirens. Gus sped through his turn onto A1A. The hot pursuit was joined by a Cocoa Beach cop. Gus stopped his Jim Rathman prepared for it to the uh, prepared vet to the floor, leaving his pursuers hopelessly behind. Gus made a wide turn into the Holiday Inn, where he found his luck holding. The parking slot in front of Al Shepard's room was open, <laughs> and Gus slid his vet between the lines and ran quickly to his room two doors away. Shedding his clothes in the dark as flashing lights and howling sirens pulled up outside, he slipped into his pajamas, peeked around the curtain to see the sheriff's deputy and the highway patrolman putting their hands on the hood of his vet. Feeling the heat coming through the fiberglass, this is the room, they announced, and began pounding on the sleeping Al Shepard's door. When Shepard opened it, all three officers grabbed him and threw him to the ground with handcuffs, handcuffs locking around his wrists. A sleepy Shepard found himself trying to explain when a pajama-clad Grissom opened his door and yelled, hey guys, can't you keep it down out there? Some of us have to go to work in a couple hours. <laughs> Gus was selected as the to fly the second Mercury flight, a suborbital flight. And uh, after a very successful launch, 
and the uh, hatch prematurely blew, and Liberty Bell 7 sank to the bottom of the ocean, three miles deep. A fellow by the name of Kurt Newport spent 14 years figuring out how to find and recover Liberty Bell. And on uh, July the 21st, 1999, 38 years from the day of the launch, he, had, he did just that. He brought Liberty Bell back to the seven from three miles deep. Liberty Bell went on a nationwide tour after it was refurbished and it's now at the Kansas Cosmosphere. There was a lot of discussion about how that hatch blew and what caused it. And there's just a new study that uh, apparently is just being uh, published today. And it says this, based on new digital image enhancements and available evidence, it is our contention that Gus Grissom did not blow the hatch. We conclude that electrostatic discharge generated by the helicopter during the unsuccessful attempt to recover Liberty Bell most likely caused the premature detonation of the explosive hatch. The report goes on to say this, the suggestion that Chris Grissom panicked at the end of his flight is pat patently absurd. Why, after flying a ballistic trajectory atop a redstone rocket, experiencing weightlessness for five minutes, pulling as many as 10 Gs during re-entry, observing a triangular rip in his recovery parachute, why would G Grissom panic? If anything, bombing in the warm Atlantic 60 years ago, the astronaut surely would have been relieved to have survived his flight. It's hopeful that this will put to rest what Gus always referred to as the hatch crap. <laughs> you probably know that Gus was a Air Force pilot that flew 100 combat missions in Korea. He was a uh, test pilot. He was an astronaut. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Gus was an excellent engineer. During the summer of 1964, he worked with the McDonnell engineers in St. Louis on the design and the manufacture of the Gemini spacecraft. He actually had so much to do with the design of Gemini that uh, the other astronauts called Gemini the Gusmobile. Gemini was a very important program because it proved that not only could man maneuver in space, but could also dock with another vehicle. And those things were very important if, if we were to get to the moon in the 60s. After Gemini, Gus was again selected to be the command pilot for the first Apollo flight. After great success with the McDonnell, Mercury, and Gemini spacecraft, it was decided to give North America the contract for the Apollo program. On January the 27th, 1967, the three astronauts climbed into their command module there was no particular concern for the safety of the crew that day because the rockets were not filled with fuel. There are a lot of things wrong with that spacecraft, starting with the communication system, prompting Gus to say, how do you expect to hear me from the moon when you can't hear me from three buildings away? There's a very poorly designed hatch on the spacecraft that took forever to, to open and there was 30 miles of wiring winding through that spacecraft. Each was supposedly insulated so that one could not arc to the other. But at 6.31 p.m. atop launch pad 34 inside the Apollo spacecraft, there was a spark. Less than a minute later, the spacecraft cracked and burst from the intense heat and pressure the Apollo 1 crew perished. 
But without the lessons learned from the uh, fire and the corrections that were made to that spacecraft, America probably would not have been able to make it to the moon in the decade of the 60s. There's no doubt that Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee would have stepped on the moon had they lived. Some people even say that they thought Gus would be the first man on the moon. I think Gus, Ed, and Roger would be pleased to know that space exploration is continuing and that we now have plans to send a man and a woman back to the moon and maybe even to Mars. Thank you. <laughs>